everyone joining us, welcome. You are in for the biggest treat today because Christopher, who is with us today, wait for it, born in Paris, has lived in places as diverse as an artist's community in Cape Cod and in Africa. His pieces have been worn and collected by notables as diverse as Queen Noor of Jordan and Maya Angelou and Elizabeth Taylor. And you may be the only one on earth or at least one of the only ones on earth who actually had conversations now with Madame Belperon and Paul Flato, which is our focus for today. So as you and I discussed, our focus for the day is really just to tell people everything about Madame Belperon and about Paul Flato that isn't in a book. There are plenty of books out there. You've all probably read them, but Christopher's the only one who actually talked to them as far as I know you know, remaining. So we're in for a treat. I think we're going to start with just a little bit of your background, a brief touch, just to get everybody excited. Then we're going to get into Madame Belperon, her pieces, and talk about lots of good stuff that you know and we don't. Paul Flato, stuff that you know and we don't. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go to your pieces, and I understand you have some really juicy ones to hold up and show us, which I can't wait. Um, so why don't we just jump in, I think. Let's do... Um, Kind of for you. Let me, so. let, let, me, let me first of all, Sharon, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a real pleasure. I'm working, right. on, I'm working on a book and you've helped crystallize a lot of my thoughts. I'm, I'm honored. It's just it's, been so much fun. It's one of the wonderful things about the pandemic, if there are any. Oh, that's Zoom, exactly right. Zoom, Zoom life. Zoom life. What I would love to know, you're born in Paris, your mother is French, and um, you created your first piece of jewelry at age eight. So, I mean, what made you start so early? Like, that's amazing. I, uh, why don't you put the picture of my father on? You got it. I'm going right over to your dad. We have, by the way, folks listening, boy, have we got some phenomenal images to show you. They're, they're just out of this world. So here is your dad. Not seeing. There he is. Okay. I, people always ask me how it is that I became a jeweler. And the answer, believe it or not, is that I owe it all to a German torpedo. And uh, in, in brief, uh, one of our first women architects, Theodate Pope Riddle, was on the Lusitania when it sank. And when she saw 1,157 men give up their lives so the women and children could get in the lifeboats, she made a vow that if she survived, she would design, build, and endow a school for boys. And she did survive, and she did build Avon Old Farms in Connecticut um, at a cost of $7 million in the early 20s. And my father was in one of the first classes. And she insisted, being an architect and an art collector, that all of the boys learn a craft as well as the regular subjects. My father chose jewelry and when I was eight years old he wanted me to have hobbies he taught me how to make jewelry no kidding so all right so your father learns how to make jewelry at the Avon school he shows you that still doesn't mean necessarily that you would jump in so I'm really interested to get well, a sense of this can you just well, tell us a little sure, bit more about your childhood because this is not everyone's childhood well, my father worked for the United Nations in the first 10 years of the United Nations, and we lived all over the world. Um, he was brought up in between Paris and Greenwich, so there was already uh, a sort of a cosmopolitan background, um, which I really only say to say that there were more aesthetics than usual in, in the equation. Um, I wanted to be an archaeologist by the time I was eight years old, and I I realized I wasn't going to dig up Tutankhamun's tomb on Cape Cod. <laughs> and I had, I had tried to grow pearls in my aquarium, and that hadn't worked either. So this, this was the answer to a prayer, my father teaching me. And, I'm going to put your, your mother up also. Well, this is my mother, who was a great World War II French hero, war hero. And unfortunately, she was captured a year before the end of the war. And she was tortured in three prisons and thrown into Robinsbrook concentration camp. Wow. And, and much decorated after the war. Uh, 
another reason that leads to Jewry and me is that when I was born in Paris, when my father, who was there in, for 24 hours in the operating room in 1949, uh, saw my mother safely through it, he went out and he bought a small suitcase full of jewelry and laid it out on my sleeping mother so that when she woke up, she would see it. I mean, and, that seems like a nice way to get up. And my mother used to occasionally show me her jewel chest and it became my definition of love in a way. Uh. And also, quite frankly, my mother unfortunately suffered, as you can imagine, from terrible PTSD <laughs> and it was also, quite frankly, my making jewelry and giving it to her was actually, quite frankly, a way to try to make her happy. That is so lovely. And this is the first piece, I think, right? This is the first piece. And my father taught me the old way of making jewelry. Many of you probably know that a jeweler's saw is about the size of a human hair. So to, to work with it, it's constantly breaking in the beginning. And this is an Indian head nickel which is much thicker than uh, a piece of silver or gold would be that one would normally be cutting and very hard. And my father made me cut these out again and again and again until I got the point. Uh, okay. So here's what brings us to our start today. And I was really excited to find an issue of Town and Country edited by Pamela Fiore, the great Pamela Fiore. And you are featured in it with Madame Belle Perron here. So maybe what we can do is just jump in, Christopher, and I'm going to sure. ask you, I, what gave you the courage to approach Madame Belle Perron? So it must be like 1980, 81. You're in your jewelry career, but I don't know anyone else who phoned her up. So what made you, what made you brave enough to do it? Actually, I've never asked Jar whether he knew her or whether he talked to her. That would be the only other person I would think might have. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I was begin, beginning to be aware of her work because um, I'm really in between generations in, in my family and in my world. So most of the people I knew were actually older than my parents. And I was an only child. We lived a very isolated way. My parents took me everywhere. And these older friends had a couple of pieces of Belle Perron from time to time. And one couple uh, had been robbed. And uh, they asked me to, if I would consider getting in touch with Madame Belle Perron to see if they could be, her workshops had been closed, but to see if they could be remade. And also the great costume jewelry designer, Mimi, Mimi, D, Mimi D.N., who's actually Princess Mimi Romanoff, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> had been talking about Madame Belfort to, to me. But it was my enthusiasm for her work, my respect that gave me the, the courage to call her. You know, she could have said no. <laughs> so I went, over, I went over to Paris for a, a week and my French is very good, but not perfect. And, you know, a 40 year old guy, I took my mother with me because I was so nervous. And- uh, I love that. Not something that you really need to know, but the only time in my entire life that this happened, I threw up in the street on the way there. I was so <laughs> I was so nervous. Oh. And oh. Uh, she was enchanting, and she would receive me every afternoon, and I oh. I would say to my mother, "Why is Madame Vilporon reaching uh, receiving me in the afternoons?" And she looked at me and she said, because Madame Belle Perron and her maid spend the morning getting her ready. Yep. And she was of a chic not to be believed at 80, 81. Um, her, her dressing room which had a dais in it that her dressing table was on, which I always thought she was on a dais. I love that. One and, should be raised up and appreciated. Why not? Exa exactly. And unlike in America, her apartment, which was huge and magnificent, was a loan from the Institut de France because, oh. they, because they recognized their artists. 
um, quite frankly. I know. Uh, I've, I've been having this conversation with people about the ballet. It's considered a public good in France. And they mm -hmm. also recognized, you know, jewelers for France. It's a public good. It's very important. Well, also, also, I was having lunch at the George Sank one day with a French friend. And he said, guess who lives across the street? And I said, I have no idea. He said, Marlena Dietrich. He said, now guess who's paying all of her bills? And I said, come on, I have no idea. He said, Jacques Long, the Minister of Culture. Well, it's well played. I'm into it. Yeah. I, we did more of that here. Now, yeah. I am now, very every, every, to every, know about this. Okay. Every day, by the way, Madame Belle Perron received me in an outfit that was a a different color, totally. And with the, white out, with the white outfits, she wore diamonds and pearls. With the green outfits, she wore emeralds. With the blue outfits, she wore sapphires. And she had a phenomenal remaining collection of her own work. And wow. this, is, this is one of the less important pieces, quote unquote. But it's the one that grabbed my heart, and I hope it will grab your hearts, because I eventually asked her, why she was wearing it and what it was. And she said, my husband was a scientist and he went to see an eclipse off the coast of Newfoundland with scientists and he came back totally disillusioned. And he said, I will never look at the stars again. So she said, I thought about it and I made this ring which is carved clouds and diamond stars so that he would never have to look up again to see the stars. Oh, I think that's so beautiful. How lovely. She was, she was extraordinary. I've you know, never read that story, so that's it, pretty cool. It brings me to tears, you know, every time I tell the story. Well. Now, the, this is just whimsical. Um, on the left is an early sketch of Madame Belle Perron's work, and on the right is an early necklace that I made out of copper wire from inside of telephone cables. And as you can see, they're both very, very similar, which I think is amusing. But of course, it's what people used to like to call a primitive motif in all, in all cultures. Mm -hmm. It's Next. interesting how we're all tied. And you did this out of telephone wire? Yep. <laughs> we're going to come back to that. All right, what's up with the Michelin ring? All right, I maybe have French, but my inspiration for my version of this was, was not the Michelin tire. This is the ring that Madame Belle Perron made that I remember, I met her in 8081, that I never saw. And the next slide shows a ring of mine, which with no connection whatsoever is, she made the closed top ridged ring too. Mm -hmm. They're exactly the same. Amazing. So, all right. Oh, wait, let me go back. I want to go to another ring for you first to explain something to us. So I'm going to scoot back to it. This is the one I was telling you. I sent it into the moon. Here we go. This is a beautiful, beautiful ring by Madame Belperon. Now, she was very taken, as you probably all know, with Or Vierge, virgin gold. And uh, as a result of her trips, uh, she was influenced by, by Yucatan jewelry and by other, other jewelries. I'm not saying this um, critically. As you also know, Paloma Picasso uses this kind of, of gold and texture a lot. And quite frankly, she saw her mother's mother and her mother's friends wearing Madame de Perron morning, noon, and night. Well, I mean, if you think about it, what shapes our ideas of beauty, right? Your idea of love comes from seeing the jewelry on your mother. It makes sense. You see these magnificent Belle Perron pieces. You can't help it. We've got a couple of designers, um, like Adelante Jewelry just said, my favorite, my favorite. I mean, they're just amazing. Well, the reason, that, the real reason that that is there is because this is a ring by Paul Flato. Yep. And uh, oh, I, may be, I may be wrong, but it's inspired by Madame Belle Perron. And he wrote, quite frankly, about hearing about Madame Belle Perron in the early 30s and stopping in to see her, I believe, in 1933. 
Wow. Um, Helen Molesworth just said that she had Madame Belperon's ring for sale and she had the tiniest fingers. Was she tiny when you walked in and you she saw her? She was tiny. She was she tiny. Was. She was tiny. And uh, uh, she had short hair slicked back that was the best possible version of blue hair. I mean, it, it was really more like steel. Wow. And, and slicked back, she was a pistol. And she also, uh, my mother uh, complimented her at one point. And one of the things that Madame Belle Perron said to me is, it's really much better, Christopher, to let other people compliment you than to do it oneself. And so my mother complimented her on her jewelry and everything. And Madame Belle Perron's answer was, what? What a beautiful French you speak, Madame, which I loved. I mean, it's so old worldly and gracious and courtly. That's Aww. not, that would not be the answer of most people. No, that's, that's a huge point. So you're in her home, your mother is there. And the first, only the first day. <laughs> you, oh. <laughs> Did you have your questions in advance? Did you know what no, you wanted no, to get No, no, not at all. No, not at all. Nothing? Did no. you um did you have like um a sense that she was happy with her representation in the world of jewelry? Did she talk about how she felt about a legacy or anything like that? No, not really, but she had been, you know, unbelievably successful and not to be crass, but as I said, her collection of her own jewelry was vast and with very important stones and pearls. So clearly, financially, she had done extremely well. I want to point out at this point, which I think is, I suppose, is written about in the books, that she heard her diamond partner, Mr. Heritz, mm -hmm. put his business in her name when he was shipped off to Auschwitz. And Madame Belperon did something that an awful lot of survivors of World War II did not do. The minute he died, but the minute his son came back from Auschwitz, she turned the company over to him. Ah, right. More people should be that generous and honest. And I was, I was one day I plucked up the courage to say, ask her if the Légion d'honneur that she was wearing on her outfits was you know the tiny little red dot whether it was uh for her work in jewelry or whether it was for her for her work in the resistance which could have been equally possible and and she said oh it, it's for my work in jewelry of course she said but i hope you didn't think this is better in french but she said i hope you didn't think that i was on the side of cowards good for her i think that's fabulous yeah, she now, was I'm I am Pistol. dying to ask you about this one. And before you answer, those of you uh, listening, please feel free, pop a question in the question box because I'm sure you also want to ask something about what it feels like to be in front of Madame Belperon. So feel free. But this one, I, I don't know anything about. And as Helen just said, it's such a wow. Can you tell us about this piece? Absolutely. Uh, I was quite dismayed when I was doing my research for this to see that this was the only picture of, of one of this series in either book. Yeah, I've never and, seen this one. Well, uh, this is part of the great genius of Madame Belperon of, inla as you all know, inlaying stones in other stones. But this is taking it to an extreme. This is smoky quartz. She also made bracelets like this out of amethyst, which were sublime. And uh, there really should be more pictures. I will say that they were quite fragile. And oh, sure. I, I hope this doesn't come, come out wrong, but I suppose that her clients were such ladies of leisure that they didn't have to open the car door or the, or the front door, or certainly not wash the dishes because otherwise jewelry like this would not have existed five seconds. Um, the next slide yeah. shows a different version. And as, I, as I suppose all of you know, her, the double band or the triple band, whether it was in in uh, precious in, uh, in in gems or in gold was a huge uh, hallmark of of Madame Belle Perrin's 
and again, very fragile. Um, I, but I, I think they're among the very best things that she that she did. Oh, just incredible! I don't suppose you asked her anything about not signing her pieces because I've always wondered why not. Well, of course, but the fact of the matter is that she did sign some of her pieces. Um, Dard Efis, her main workshop, signed a lot of the pieces, and the problem is. The problems are that their poinçon, their hallmarks, are microscopic. Oh. I mean, microscopic. And quite frankly, with a certain amount of wear, uh, that's that. You can't see what's, what's what. Also, I've, I discovered that uh, because of, of international tax laws, it wasn't unheard of for people to file off the, the hallmarks. Wow. Oh, that is such a crime. But trying to just get out of a few dollars? Well, a lot of dollars. But uh, it makes it, it does make it very hard for those of us who really would like to know when something was made and by whom. No, oh, absolutely. What a, wow, what a crime. You're getting a lot of hearts for that comment. <laughs> and this is another one of her precious stone pieces. I mean, the simplicity, the minimalism. Uh, the purity and the beauty is is extraordinary. Talk to us about the Christmas tree. <laughs> it's not a Christmas tree. <laughs> this was this was another one of her. She wouldn't have called them collections, but it was a theme in her work. And uh, I think they're absolutely beautiful. Here you see it in rock crystal with diamonds. She did it in gold. She did it in gold and diamonds. Uh, you name it. I have a funny story about this. I saw a, a, a gold version at, I think it was Sotheby's in London, in their catalog, and they didn't know it was Madame Belle Perron. So I got on the on the horn, and I did end up, much to my surprise, being able to buy it for $2,500. And Sotheby's called me later that day and said, oh, our, our favorite Belle Perron client was stuck in traffic. He, he's asking us if you would please sell the pin to him. And I said, sure. Oh, I said, what? You did? Wait. I said, sure, I will. Add an extra zero. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's amazing. In fact, Helen Molesworth did say they had a few pieces that had had the hallmarks removed to ship them. So there you go. it was very much the case. Yeah, um, you what you got here that you want to tell us about? No, nothing. Just more, more of the Christmas tree. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm being very, very rude. Sorry yeah, about that. That's all right. Fans of Belle Perron, my apologies. But tell me the truth. Don't you see a little Christmas tree in there? Come on. Just, just for a second. Nobody? Nobody? Bare, barely. <laughs> all right. And then we have another one. This is magnificent. And she carried the theme into necklaces, uh, you mm -hmm. know, earrings, you name it. Anything you want to highlight with this one or more of the same? Okay, let's talk about this. Now, doing my research for this, I just, it's, it's hard to believe, but I've always known that Madame Belperon was a huge influence on us all. I have to say that I didn't realize how huge her influence was because I'm not going to name names as, I, as we go through these pieces, but if you think about it, you will see pieces that, look like. that remind you vividly of, of today's jewelry uh, left, right, and center. It's a, it's a point. I mean, you know, we, we keep having this conversation, you and I, which is, you know, there's no patent protection in jewelry design. And it's difficult to say where the line between inspiration and imitation how you know can two very clever people come up with the same design separately Richa just added she loves these yeah I mean they're amazing but you know these do bring up a very good point so when you're we get you're, to... you're you're very charitable <laughs> well <laughs> gotta try right but it's hard to say I mean, you know, I, I had this conversation with um, Siddha Kazliwal of Gem Palace when we're looking at the 1960s pieces 
uh, from the French houses and Italian houses that are clearly inspired by the Mughal jewelry. You know, it's an interesting conversation because I think personally the Bulgari ones are very much clearly Bulgari as well as Indian inspired. They have an unusual use of color that's not Indian. They have sapphires, which wouldn't have been in the pieces. There's enough variation. But well, when you look what, at the Bel Perron pieces, some are right on the nose. So it's a well, little quite, Well, quite frankly, Madame Bel Perron was inspired by Mog Mughal jewelry herself. Mm -hmm. I mean, who inlays rubies and diamonds into jade? The yeah. Mughals. Let's give everybody some credit. You yeah. know, we've got a global high beautiful, and beautiful, beautiful and century work. of inspiration. Absolutely. I would Next. love to know what you think about this one. Let's go back well, to that. What this? Do you think, Sarah? Oh. No, I just put that in there to show that she could use the same materials and theme in, in earrings as well as necklaces. Okay. And I, I, this is perfectly beautiful. Beautiful. Let's hit this one. So the three band or two band or four band uh, bracelets were a theme of hers. Uh, I have to say uh, that I saw, I've seen any number of these that were filled in by other jewelers. Horrible. The space uh, in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and yeah, they're just absolutely horrible. <laughs> Again, as usual, these could not be more chic. Oh, no, divine. Absolutely amazing. Now, this one, I think you want to make a big point. Well, just that it's it's so beautiful, you know, again, the minimalism. One of the first pieces that I saw of Madame Belle Perrault's, uh belonged to an American friend. She'd inherited it from her mother and it was a bracelet with all sapphires, not like this, the entire surface was sapphires. So it was blue. And this is the thing that in the town and country article, the only thing they got wrong, I mean, I could, I, I bang on until I'm blue in the face that Madame Belle Perrault used solid color. And it came out in, in town and country, solid use of color, which uh, unless I'm mistaken, is not the same thing. But the all sapphire bracelet, which is living in New York, is to fall on your knees in front of it so beautiful. Oh, I can't even imagine. What a treat. Um, hi, Oscar Hammond Brothers, another great jeweler manufacturer joining us. To say the, to say the least. And I had many, many clients in my youth who had colored diamond work by Oscar Hammond. Um, and by the way, they just said, they just called you a jewelry genius. How many of us listening would like that compliment? That is spectacular and well-deserved. Uh, that, must, that, must, that must be why I'm, I'm so broke. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all, though? Yay, COVID. <laughs> well, especially, especially now. Again, the off-center bracelets and necklaces. Uh, I like this one very much. The, yeah. next the next slide is a necklace. And it... Oh, I've got a, a, this one? No, it's a, oh. gold, a gold twist with diamonds scattered yeah. on, on the sides. I may have I may have goofed on that one. No so, problem. Okay. And again, I'm not saying this spitefully. 30, 40 years ago, I, I was I ran into one of the most famous socialites in New York, at I guess Christie's, and there was a uh, Belle Perron bracelet uh, with the, with the, with the zigzag and the off center diamonds. And I said, now here's a piece by one of the greatest jewelers ever. And she, to her credit, she was learning things. So she said, oh, you mean Fulco de Verdura? And I said, no, actually, Madame Belle Perron. Woo! <laughs> no, Madame Belle Perron. And I, I meant to say this earlier on. The reason that I got in touch with Madame Belle Perron and Paul Flato was, it's hard to believe now, but in 1980, they were virtually, virtually forgotten by everybody except for a few jewelers and a few old clients. And I was terrified that their archives and their whatever knowledge would die with them. And I, you know, was determined if I could to gather information that I could pass on, you know. Well, 
it, it's so hard to picture now when especially everyone listening and our group of you know colleagues were so rabid as fans about their work but what an important point you know there's ebbs and flows in taste and it's shocking that at well, that also, time well, also, there was a conversation also, also part of my own development i was extraordinarily lucky that my parents, my family, my parents' friends of all different nationalities had all had important jewelry which they'd had to sell. And what they kept were the tiny Fabergé pieces, the tiny Cartier pieces, which had no value at all in the 50s and the 60s. And that became my jewelry vocabulary. I mean, how, how, lucky, how, lucky. how lucky could I have been? Really incredible. All right, now we can talk about this one. Madame Belperon made this tiara, and unless I'm very much mistaken, it belonged to a, a, an American woman called Kitty Herrick Coleman, who was a great niece of Isabella Stewart Gardner of the Gardner oh. Museum in Boston. And of the museum and the theft and the whole thing. Yeah, Neat. and unfortunately, as you can easily imagine, pieces like this were dismantled constantly. Sure. Uh, which is a pity. Uh, most tiaras, as you know, can be dismantled, sometimes can be double Fit. use, be a batch of clips, but this w most of them were dismantled. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, the swirl motif. These are just to, these are just to show Madame Belperal's extraordinary use of color. I mean, look at that. And Wild. One, of the, one of the things that, I mean, who who was who was doing this in the in the thirties and the forties? Oh, well, this is the, it's the 50s. Yeah. Um, One thing that she said to me, which I resonated with and helped me a lot, was she said, "You must not compromise on stones or workmanship." Wow. Um, and I would have liked to have worked for a big company, except that I wouldn't have, because I immediately knew that they would have taken my designs and, and used shortcuts, which would have made me feel that it was no longer my piece. Right, look at this color combination. Isn't that just stunning? Totally contemporary. Uh, it's wild. This could be today, right? Unbelievable. Absol absol absolutely. Now, these I do not know. And, you know, my first thought is here are the Mughals. And I will say Richa Goyal Sikri pointed out that the Mughals themselves were inspired by different kingdoms in India as well. So this goes on and on throughout history. I just want to make sure we're inclusive of everybody. But what, what you got here? The, these are a pair of large bins that were made for the Duchess of Windsor. Ooh, wow. One in, yeah. one in green with less red and one in red with less green. Yeah, super. I mean, they're, they're fabulous. Fabulous. Now, these, I think we have a lot to say. I hate them. I know. That's why I put them <laughs> up. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what she was thinking. Um, Do but, you think she possibly had a, a commission? Do you think she could have been working for someone who requested something specific? I'm always curious what that client designer interaction is like. And I'm going to ask you about that later, too. But I did do this to be annoying. <laughs> her, her, her character was antithetical to that. But anything, but anything is possible. Um, something I wanted to say was, tragically, um, I, when I came back from that week in Paris, I went to Connoisseur magazine, where I knew Tom Hobing, the former head of the Metropolitan Museum, sure. and Philip, Philip Herrera, who were the editors. And, Horst, the great photographer, had gone and photographed Madame Belper on, the, I think, in the 40s. Sure. And they, they instantly liked my idea to send Horst and me back to, like, do a bookend full, full circle. And tragically, 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 she died a week before we were to arrive. Oh, no. Now, I, 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 I know you want to tell people the connection you see with Flato on that one. And I don't want to stop you. Right. Uh, before I, one last thing, I want to give a really big shout out to Ward Landrigan and to Nico. Definitely. Because, because as I said, I was terrified that her archives would disappear. They're and as a, better for them. There's, there's the necklace I, I was talking Sorry. about. And 
we begged her heir, who was not a member of her family, to let us photograph her collection of jewelry. Absolutely not. We begged him to let us photograph the apartment, which said so much about her. And he said, absolutely not. And he was a real think. Mm -hmm. And I really did not know what was going to become of her immense collection of, of watercolor renderings and jewelry. And Ward and Nico are just to be blessed. Absolutely. And for those who aren't aware, the Landrigans do own the, um, es the estate, the archive of Belpernon, and have kept that legacy alive, as well as to own Verdura. So very, very important. That this, is, this is a bracelet that Madame Belperon wore. This is a bracelet that Madame Belperon wore often. And it's an aesthetic of a piece of, of also of mine that I'll show you later, but cool. of, of extreme luxury looking totally, quote unquote, throw away. Mm -hmm. I mean, look and, at the gumball sizes of those stones. Uh, fabulous, fabulous. Those are big. They're all big. Yeah. Um, and there's the diamond ring that I want to show. Uh, of Madame de Parent? In rock crystal. Oh, boy. I'm not super sure I have that one. Oh, More this, the, yes, I do actually. The sketch with showing the side view. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry, folks. I'm not the world's greatest photo assistant, but I'm trying. How's that? Yes. This is a ring that Madame Belle Perel still had in her, her collection, if you can imagine. And the diamond was immense. And again, okay. the idea of, you know, what would now be God knows what, uh, you know, uh, $700,000 stone or more in a piece of rock crystal with nothing else. I mean, that, I was brought up with the solid color aesthetic of the, you know, finished furniture designers, painters like Archil Gorky, Miro, and our, my parents' own great collection of African art we put together when we were living in the African jungle. And this just, resonated to me instantly. Couldn't this agree not, more. Stunning. Not, fabulous. Fabulous. All right. We are tight on time because you know you and I could talk for hundreds of years. So I'm going to push you into Flato. And here he is. So I went, I went, I went to uh, Mexico City for 10 days in 1983 after, I'd, after Madame Belbar had died. And um, he greeted me with... Um, Actually, I, I had called. I had uh, I had uh, called Diana Vreeland before I went down to see what she had to say about Paul Flato, and she said, "There's one word that describes him: enthusiast." Oh, okay. He, I mean, he was just a bulliant, and he greeted me at the door of his store in, in the Zona Rosa by saying, "You've probably heard a lot of terrible things about me, and they are all true." So for people who don't know, there's a whole like case and conviction and oopsie and things happening, but for another time. So I he also gonna... he also said it was extremely clear from from day one. He said, I cannot draw a single line. Really? He was not a designer. He was one of the world's greatest jewelry salesmen ever. Huh. Ever. What skill in and of itself. Wowza. Salesman, I mean, salesman, salesman, and editor. Here's a pair of cufflinks that he gave to me, which was terribly sweet of him. Um, Peter Duchin's father, the famous, also famous band leader, yeah. Eddie, Eddie Duchin, lost one of his uh, pair of these. And he, he walked into Plato and he said, I've lost, I've lost one of my nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Plato, Plato said, which one? <laughs> See, Helen, I told you we'd go blue at some point in this conversation. What you got here? And not what we wanted, sadly. Uh, Plato became very, very, very deaf. And so he made a lot of sign language jewelry. Uh, I was hoping this said something interesting. It's actually A and B. Um, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't care for these, but they illustrate... As you, along with what you'll see later. Flato, like a number of designers I could mention, had actually a number of designers working for him. Sure, including Fulco. 
full coup d'etat, or briefly. And of course, then it becomes very hard, like with Madame Belparon at Boivin, to know right. who designed what. But um, Fulco was his most most famous. Um, the main designer was a woman called Josephine Forrestal, mm. whose husband had been the Secretary of the Navy and who was so hounded by Senator Joe McCarthy that he threw himself out of a window. Uh, he was he was bisexual and it wasn't the time. What was a so bummer. It was so terrible. <laughs> she was extraordinarily talented. He also, had, he also had a, a, a jeweler called uh, George Headley. And George Headley went on to marry one of the great Whitney heiresses and live in Lexington, Kentucky, where the Whitney stables are. Oh, very helpful. Where, where if any of you ever get the chance, there's a tiny museum that he built on the property and he made elaborate objet, jeweled objet, very much in the style of Dresden's Green Vaults. No um, Yeah, and, and used the Whitney family uh, spectacular, disassembled them to use the stones. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> including, um, a, including a Briolette necklace, which had belonged to the Sultan of Turkey. Um, yes, please. This one I want to know what we got here. Well, I don't like this. Um, <laughs> and I think that's part of what I'm saying about, about different designers. Depends on who it was. And also different workshops. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one inevitably ends up seeing, seeing a disparity in the quality and the theme uh, of jewelry. And of course, it's very hard for Plato to know who did what, as I said. Plato came in from Central Park with an oak leaf in his hand, and he handed it, I think, to Fulco and said, make a jewel. And again, that's, you know, his saying he couldn't design a line, but he could. He had the eye and the vision. About, yeah, he had the eye. And of course, there's, this is confusing because Millicent Rogers is sometimes given credit for these pieces. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's all those three connections. <clears throat> well, and I think it's such an important point. You and I talk about this all the time, which is we are trying to put the names on the workshops because they did initiate a lot of work under great house names. And there's a lot of variation in the work. And the, the Flato pieces you just showed are a huge illustration of that. Now, this is yours, right? Oh, I bought I bought at auction a lot of Plato sketches when they came up, and I mean, what could be more different right. than this right. kind of setting and the gold hands? I mean, I that's mean, a, that yeah. in and of so itself. So we go from a, that to this. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These are clearly yeah. different people. Yeah, exactly. This is magnificent. This is one of my favorite Plato pieces. Yeah. I mean, it is a phenomenal necklace. Yeah. I will say, I will say again that. If, fair amount of this important jewelry, I think, is unwearable. But it's the same thing is true today, unfortunately. And, no, uh, you know, what I don't particularly like today are the jewels that quite clearly could either stab somebody or break instantly. But this is, this is just a piece of, of Plato's that I love. Yeah, this is phenomenal. A, a pin. I mean, who um, would want to wear that? This one I of want the, to ask you about because I love it. That's a great piece. It is you just know. a great piece. Look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody should wear that on their wrist. That looks really fun. How and about his, this one? His, his, his version of, of uh, being inspired by Cartier's Tutti Frutti period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is clearly a different person. Yes. And oh. this, this belonged to the man I think is the single most distinguished man in our industry alive, Ralph Asmarian, who had, oh. who had the single best taste of anyone in existence. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous oh, piece. Interesting. It is a gorgeous piece, but again, cannot be the same person who came up with, you know, this variation that we're looking at, right? They're completely different people. This is the one <laughs> I like the best. This is right. 
Me too. That that was from a, a picture that he gave me uh, uh, when I was in Mexico City. Um, I don't know whether that's in, in the books or not. To go back to the... Um, uh, well, one thing that I can say, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of uh, the huge pink diamond that was found in a, a vault of a recluse who had been living in hospital suites most of her life, one of the four daughters of Senator Clark from Montana, mm -hmm. who owned the Comstock lot, com part of the Comstock load. Mm -hmm. And um, her sister was a great client of Flato's, uh, Ma Ma Marius de Brabant. She came in one day, she said, she was giving a dinner party that night for 10 women, including herself, and she wanted to put a diamond bracelet in every plate. So in, the, in whatever it was in the 1930s, she spent 10,000 a bracelet and 20 on hers because they had all suffered heartaches. I mean, if anybody wants to throw such a party, I'm available. Me too. Yeah. And, yeah. and he, he, we'll offered her, he offered her a discount and she refused. Incredible. Now we're on to something that I think everybody's been waiting for because this is you. And if anybody's wondering what Christopher looked like when he asked Madame Belperon to speak with him and Paul Flader to speak with him, I think you can see pretty darn glam. So well, what... this is actually this is actually about ten years earlier. This is at a, I was the best man at a wedding in Normandy, and that's of course I had gone back and forth to France all my life, but this was the first time that I actually went to France by myself. Love, this is so chic. Now you. Folks listening may or may not know, but Christopher is actually immortalized in a painting by Alex Katz, of which I'm extremely jaloux. That is amazing. How did this happen? You'll never guess which one I am. I know, you're the one <laughs> in the back with your glasses on being fab, although I prefer to think that you inspired all the poses. I'll take them all. An interesting thing about this painting, there are several interesting things. One is that Italian Vogue which is such a terrific magazine, was inspired to do an entire layout on, based on this painting. And they put together a group of models that looked like each of us and posed them in the same, in the same poses. I love which, that. I think which, it's so chic. It was wow. un, un, unbelievably chic. Um, wow. Alex and Ada, I've been extraordinarily lucky to become friends with him in, in like 1973. And he's one of our great painters. His prices are missing a zero compared to his peers. And, but he's in every museum all over the world. Now, I want to get to this because I think everybody should see your work. These phenomenal earrings are on Maya Angelou and Bravo. Um, how did this come about? And I'm going to put your necklace up also because I want people to see this. When I was first starting out, 95% uh, uh, of all the real jewelry in America was made on 47th Street. And I have had to go up into every little office and meet the people and ask, ask them to show me what they had because people didn't have glass cases. They had everything in little glycine bags. And at one point, I fell across these X-shaped uh, cultured freshwater pearls. They're not carved. That's their actual shape. So and cool. bought every single one that I could lay my hands on ever since. I loved Renaissance jewelry. And uh, to me, the, the mermaids, the swans, the boats, that we, were, which use pearls as the main element. And uh, so I had a, a, an affinity with these right away. Lily Auchincloss, Lily Auchincloss, the mm -hmm. great philanthropist in New York <clears throat> and style icon, had become a great, great friend. A mutual friend introduced her, us because he felt we needed each other. She had just been divorced by her husband, and my father had just killed himself. And um, we became great, great, great friends. And she bought a pair of these earrings, put them on, and I kid you not, every bold face name internationally beat their way to my door. Yeah, that's the, that's the kind of icon she was. What I love to say is, yes, men looked at her, but guess what? Women looked at her. 
I love that. Now I'm going to say something you shouldn't, but folks viewing, take a look at this and ask yourself if it reminds you of someone modern <laughs> and the pieces <laughs> came out after his pieces. I'm just saying. Um, this is the last one I'm going to put up before. And by I'm by the way, that, by the way, one. that by the way, that was 1981. That yeah, that, so do the math. And and and. and I want to say, in terms of, of my career, when somebody gives me carte blanche, they get the best single piece they could possibly get. A client of mine and friend handed me a check for $25,000 and said, make something. This is it? That was it. To die for. Absolutely to die for. These are it, would not, it would not be $25,000 today. <laughs> and do you want to point out who you worked with on this one? Any... This is, this, is, this is the dean of, of New York jewelers, Andre Chervin at Carvin French, who made some of the most extraordinary pieces I've ever been able to produce. And the, both the Argyle Diamond Mines and Cora Diamond had asked me to do pink diamond collections for them. And I was wandering around saying, great, but what the hell am I going to make? And I was meditating in my Zen temple and suddenly noticed that there was a, a sprig of quince blossoms on the altar and the rest is history. Done. Now I'm going to turn off the comments and ask you to show us your pieces, please. Oh, oh, that. Okay. Let's see. How do I do this? Yep. You're perfect. This perfect. is, I make flower pins, which is, funny because I used to be geometric early on, uh, but this is a lightning ridge opal and oh. ab abalone pearls, not abalone shell. Divine. And I, I hate prongs, so I use the diamonds as pistols and stamens for the flower. I mean, that is just heaven. Now this is my, my favorite new piece. Woo, is that jade? It's jade and it, it was a bracelet. It yeah. was a it was a bracelet, uh, but it's my homage to Cartier's Tutti Frutti, and yeah. it's emeralds, sapphires, rubies, and diamonds. Can you wear and it as a pin? Oh, so chic! Love and it. I like I like big pins on the shoulder. This That's I don't bad. know I, I don't know if this is going to show, but to go back to Madame Belperon. Oh yes, it shows. That's a little, a little farther away from the camera. Back it up, back it up a bit more. And now closer towards the, go the other direction left for you. Just a second. Uh, nope, nope. Come back, yep. Ooh, that's so gorgeous. And these are huge nuggets of sapphires, emeralds, rubies. Etc. Oh, I love those. those are divine. It's a you know you know it's a it's a happy necklace. It is a happy necklace. It's so uh, pretty. I felt very lucky to 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 do that. This I like. I had a Byzantine period, and this is this is one of my pins. Gorgeous. What's this the is center stone? The center stone is a sensational rhodolite garnet. Wowza! A little higher up, please. Yeah, Com perfect. Com completely flawless. And oh, that is beautiful, stunning. Beautiful deep red. All this right, is... Christopher, we're on a 1.4 minute countdown. Ooh, okay, this, looking. This is a black diamond ring with a pearl. That should come home with me. And these, of course, are... Oh, the famous earrings, the Maya Angelou earrings. Those are exquisite. And by the way, Cicely Tyson bought the earrings as a present for Maya Angelou, and they were subsequently on every New York City bus as I'm ads wrong. for six months. What fun is that? Now, we're out of time, so we're going to definitely have to do a round two because I didn't have time for everyone's hundreds of questions. But you is just there, got to there... are amazing from Richa. And I know the one thing that we want to let people know is Christopher is very active on Instagram. So you can also send a bunch of questions. This is going to go immediately to our IGTV for you all to have a great look and fun again. And we'll do a round two because I know it's going to be by popular demand. I cannot thank you enough. It is so lucky to hear what you said with them and what you what you know and your work is exquisite it's just such a treat thank you well i, well, I, w I was so lucky 
um, you know, and as I said, doing this with you is a bright moment in the middle of this awful pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined Thank us. Thank you, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.